Uh, I'm going to count to five and then let's clap at the same time. One, two, three, four, five. Shit. Nice. <laughs> Welcome to If I Were King, the podcast where two friends somewhere on earth talk about the new world order and other things, including, but not limited to, the lizard people. Did, are you, did you come prepared today? Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Uh, do you want to just get right into it? Sure, dude. Let's do this shit. Cool. You want to open up? I have no idea. I didn't even accidentally open your notes this time, so I have no idea. <laughs> oh, cool. Well, you're in for some, some surprises again. <laughs> okay, all right, Paul. So tell me, if you were king, what would you do? Yes. Yeah, so this week I've come up with a good one. I, uh, I don't know how it is. Do you have a lot of panhandlers in Canada? Uh, what's a panhandler? Panhandler is... People who stand on the side of the road and ask for money. Ah, uh, okay. Uh, sure, in Vancouver, Vancouver we got lost. Yeah, it's absolutely prolific in Albuquerque too. So, yeah, but I, I've I've been getting really tired of it. So my plan is, if I were king, we would essentially just uh, have the town and city councils select some police officers, vigilantes to to fix this issue. And they would drive around and when they see a panhandler, they, they take all the money from the panhandler. Half of it goes to their salary and half of it goes to charitable organizations for homeless people. Yeah. So basically the problem just solves itself because you have these people paying their own salaries by taking money from people. <laughs> <laughs> that's yeah all right let me let me understand so when you say pan are these just homeless people asking for money is that what you're saying they're not necessarily homeless oh okay are they you typically homeless well they're supposed to be homeless in theory is that a thing in 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 in, in albuquerque where people just ask for money <laughs> Even if they don't need it? Oh, dude, people are definitely doing that shit. Not just in Albuquerque, everywhere, man. Probably in Canada, too. There's people out there asking for money who have money and a job. And, or, you know, don't want to have a job, in other words, I should say. But, yeah. All right. So, how would. So, you said you'll uh, tell me more about it. Yeah. So, basically. Uh, these officers are selected to be money confiscators, cash confiscators. I came up with the term cash confiscators. 50% of what they get, they can keep, right? 50% they have to donate to like governmental and charitable organizations that help people. Uh, and then I came up with a third thing, which is 100% of people observed to, to give money to these people. Uh, we'll have to do a year in the gulags. No parole or bail. <laughs> Keeping up the gulag con conversation. <laughs> Can you tell me a little bit about your personal experience with uh, you so-called panhandlers? Every fucking intersection in Albuquerque has a panhandler. Every fucking one. It's annoying as shit, dude. It's gotten way out of hand. It's not just like occasionally you're driving and there's one. It's like every single end. It's so there's like 400 in this city people that do this at least, dude. And there are definitely people that aren't homeless. And not only that, but recently there's a new trend starting, which is people who are raising money, fundraising for like charitable organizations and like, you know, whatever they're they're they got cancer or whatever. Now they're panhandling for money for charity for it's fucking out of control. It's seriously out of control here. There's like hundreds of people doing it. All right, so paint paint me paint me a word picture. So I think I don't really understand. I guess the pan, like what I what I imagine is, um, in Vancouver, just like a homeless guy sitting on the street, and he'll be like, you know, do you have any spare change or money or whatever? Tell me about this panhandling at the intersections. What does that look like? Yeah, so it's a lot more out of control here too, in that way also because. People just stand on like the little tiny, when you're turning left, they stand in the middle. So they stand in like the most dangerous part of the intersection and they're standing there and, you know, they could fall into the road or whatever, because it's only like, you know, I'm going to put it in meters for you. It's like a quarter of a meter wide, right? And they're standing on that. 
and hold them their hand out for money, holding a sign usually with some story about their life and asking for money. Interesting. All right. Okay. So that sounds tip like that sounds normal, I guess, uh, from my experience. In Vancouver, that doesn't happen uh, much. I don't. Yeah, I don't see it much at all, to be honest. Um, but tell me about. I'm really interested in this uh, this charity organization kind of jumping on. Uh, I I don't know what do you call it a trend or this strategy. Yeah, I've only seen it a little bit in the past, like three weeks or so. But it's starting, dude, and it's going to take over. There there will be people like, you know, uh, just, yeah, they're just standing there. And their sign says, uh, we are raising money for, like, you know, whatever, uh, our friend who got cancer. We're raising money for whatever the fuck it is. It's just... Like a grassroots GoFundMe kind of thing? Yeah. Except for instead of using GoFundMe, they stand on a street corner and ask you for money while you're driving. Okay, that's interesting. So, so, so it's not like particularly um, charity organizations, uh, like uh, not necessarily organizations. It's, it's just kind of charity, as in people uh, like su- asking for support, like you said. Like, yeah, um, it's more GoFundMe ask than. Uh, than actual charitable organizations, probably. They, they could probably actually get in trouble if they were actually associated with something. Yeah, yeah, that, that's what my first thing, like... Our cops would not do shit about that, so that's that's not true, though, on the other hand. Yeah, no, because I was just thinking, like, well, you know, I work for a charity. And I was like, if we did that, uh, that would not fly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I was like, okay, all right. It's, it seems um, this strategy... Or this ad- adoption of this strategy by like the general public. See, it seems very um, very American to me. Very uh, <laughs> like, <laughs> like uh, you just gotta go get it and make your dreams come true, and or save your buddy from hospital expenses. <laughs> does does that sound very American to you? <laughs> it does. Well, if it's for medical expenses, expenses especially, man. Fucking <laughs> that's the most American thing ever. Yeah, maybe that's why we don't ever see it here. Um, it it does it does happen on occasion in Canada because like not every you know not everything's a hundred percent covered. Um, yeah. You might you know your initial, you know, treatment for, um, for can for example when I was when I was reporting, uh, like last year somebody, um, they were raising money to for like um someone who went went through cancer. You know, they had their treatment and all that. That's all, you know, covered by, um, you know, the government. Um, but what the, isn't covered is, like, they needed to go and, like, do this recovery kind of, um, I don't know, like, it was, it was like, um, I think it was called Something Something Cancer House, and it was, like, a recovery for people who went through chemo and stuff. And, like, that's, like, you know, they'll have people who can help with, like, um, like physio stuff or um, um, occupational therapy and stuff like that. And just, it's it's like a room and a place where, you know, they get taken care of. Um, you know, kind of optional, but kind of not optional, but also that's not, that's not covered. Do you, do you under, does that make sense what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, like it's the af, like the after, like the, the quote unquote perceivable optional part of treatment, which is not so optional. But yeah, so it's, people do do that in Canada a little bit, but uh, yeah, that's uh, pretty, I've heard that time and again, like people raising money for American hospital bills. Um. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, it, it can be an insanely expensive. But yeah, anyway, I, I, you know, if I were king, though, that shit's got to end. You can't <laughs> fucking stand on the median that's, you know, two feet wide, a quarter of a meter, whatever the hell, and fucking just basically harass people all day long because it's fucking every intersection that you pull up to dude it's you know it used to be that i i think even since i was a kid it's changed totally in the city like there used to be you know you might see that every once in a while but now you go for a drive and you see it 5 10 15 times just before you get to your destination it's like, it's really out of control, man. 
Yeah, that's really. So when you said when you said like four hundred earlier, was that just like a number off the top of your head, or is that like an actual like? Oh, I'm just making shit up there, but I would guess that it's literally that because like in the hundreds. I mean, yeah, it's definitely in the hundreds because there's hundreds of intersections where they're doing this. Very interesting. Yeah, that you can pass by. Yeah, it's crazy, man. Um, other crimes punishable by cash, cash confiscation I came up with. Uh, looking at me funny. <laughs> Having sex on a Tuesday. <laughs> sucking one's own dick and bragging about it on Twitter. Having a Twitter account. <laughs> and owning a book. And I left it at that. <laughs> <laughs> but we could come up with a committee or a panel of concerned evangelical Christians to come up with a longer list. <laughs> so why why evangelical Christians, Paul? Uh, because they're just getting out of control in this country too. So I figured why not? But like put them to work, is that what you're saying? <laughs> Well, no, just it's the satirical irony thing. It's like, let's make the situation even fucking worse. Okay. Yeah, because... It's, it sounds like it would probably get worse. Yeah, it probably would if you just gave evangelical Christians the option of uh, controlling everything via cash confiscation, pretty much. Yeah, I feel like the the combination of one the american police force and two or police forces and two um american evangelical christians is uh a, like i don't i i would be afraid for your country <laughs> dude that's basically already how it is <laughs> <laughs> except yeah anyway different but <laughs> it's already like that shit <laughs> that's what i would do if i were king this week this is very. That's very interesting. I I also have um, I also have a min- municipal related um, <laughs> thing I would change. It's sort of municipal. Um, so as you know, Paul, I I'm um, I guess I would call how do I call myself? Uh, I'm a regular cyclist. I cycle regularly. I cycle to work. I cycle for whatever groceries, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and since I started my la- my new job a couple months ago, um, I noticed this thing. So I'm going to tell you what I would change. If I were king, I would change how people perceive the difficulty of cycling. Okay? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> what, is it, what, what first comes to your mind when you hear that? Uh, the first thing that comes to mind is my brother has, and his buddy... They have this thing against people who ride road bikes and wear their Lance Armstrong looking ass fucking clothing. And they wear sponsored clothing, even though they're sponsored by nobody. And they ride around dressed like that. That's the first thing that comes to my mind. (laughs) I I also don't like those um, people. (laughs) (laughs) You shouldn't. (laughs) Fucking deplorable <laughs> i mean unless you're actually training for a race then fine whatever i guess but uh, i feel like some aren't but anyways that's not my point uh so so anyways like i said no i'm a regular cyclist i do that and since i started my last job a couple of months ago uh you know i get the usual comments like oh that's cool or whatever that's a great way to stay fit or you know whatever that's kind of normal um and you know it was, i think it was a fairly cycling city it likes to propagandize itself as the best city in the world for cycling it's not um I'll, maybe i'll get into that in a little bit later um but but yeah so um you know the the reactions can also change also when i describe my route to work so i i take the most straight and direct route to work it's just going down one of these um i guess i'd call it like a main street um it's called kingsway um so i go straight down it and it's um you know, just for context, um, this 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 street is like doable for cycling. Like people do it a lot. Um, um, 
but the thing like it's normally it's a it's a four lane road right like two ways each way and it's got six lanes in total like for tr and for parking on either side right one one on each side for parking but during rush hour in the morning going uh going west to downtown that parking lane is open for traffic so there's three lanes going down um and usually that parking lane there's enough room for like parking and cycling so you have you know you'll be just cycling in between traffic and the bike and the parked um cars and usually have enough space and it's not really a problem but in the morning like i said um that lane's open lo opens up to like regular traffic so it's like you know it's kind of a bus lane but it's also a traffic lane so you, at that point i'm just sharing the lane which is fine with me i don't really mind um i go fast enough it's it's, it's a slight downhill all the way so like you're not going super slow and people you know I, I haven't had any complaints from drivers. Like, everyone's been pretty civil. They just go around me like I'm a bus. Um, but anyways, my point is um, we had, we host an event at work, and I show up on my bike. Um, and I actually got, like, kind of different comments because usually, you know, I park my bike at work in the underground parking, and I come up, and, you know, they just see me. They don't really see my bike or anything like that. Um but, you know, when they actually saw me and um, I was doing photography for the event, so um, I had my camera gear, my backpack and whatever. Um, a lot of people were kind of like, uh, I guess you'd call them kind of like shocked a little bit, kind of like a little bit in disbelief. Dis disbelief. Um, you know, I got the questions like, oh, how far was this ride? Like, wow, that must have been so far. And like, wow. Um, and it wasn't. For this ride, it was it was only 12 kilometers, right? So... And it was basically all downhill and flat, so um, twelve kilometers is not is not far. It took about thirty five minutes, so pretty pretty regular regular time, even if you were in a car uh, going somewhere. Um, except for that day, actually, there was a fire at the uh, wood recycling plant, and uh, that definitely slowed me down because um, that smoke was that smoke be thick. Uh, I definitely am living a, a year or two less because of that day. Uh, <laughs> all the toxic fumes um but yeah anyway so it just to me they were just like so shocked about how just like how they like it's 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 like i like i did something crazy like run a i don't know like i don't know like climbed everest or something you know yeah <laughs> um so like just to me it kind of just showed like how little people really like know about how easy cycling is like you know it's especially like the relatively flat routes um and i think this kind of stems from most people haven't ridden a bike since they were like a kid and then when you're a kid you don't really like i guess record your distances and your times and stuff and your speed um but even if you like go for a bike ride with your friend on the weekend or whatever um you're probably not recording that uh i record everything because i like to have as much data on my on my on my cycling as possible just to like you know how fast am i going what's my average speeds etc cetera, etc cetera. Um, but yeah, I think most people don't realize, like, they go a lot further than they realize. And like, you know, if you walk, like, if you run 10K, like, okay, that's, I would call that like beginner medium, you know, or if you did a 10K run, um, but like a 10K, 12K bike ride is like super beginner, like, especially if you're going at your own pace, like, it's not a problem. But, um, you know, honestly, my point, you know, uh, obviously big, big believer of, you know, Cycling is a primary mode of transportation in cities. Um, obviously, it doesn't really work in rural places, um, or not as much at least. Um, so, you know, a commute, you know, less than 20K. 20K, you know, is at that point, it's getting kind of far, um, but doable if, like, if you're, like, quote, hardcore, I guess. Um, <laughs> but, like, like for me, my, 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 my commute, my direct commute is uh, just under 4.5K. Uh, so it takes me between nine and 15 minutes. Um, it's, it's not, it's not long. It's not hard. Um, I would change people's perception of, of cycling, Paul, uh, or the difficulty of cycling because it's so doable and so many people do it. And especially with the, with the rise of e-bikes, um, I think I th it's, it's so much more doable. Um, I guess this really ties in, I, I, in, into like that Kingsway where, um, you know kind of like why i'm saying this is like on kingsway at some points on kingsway like there's visual visible signage that says this is like those those two that those those two extra like bonus lanes i guess you could call them uh during rush hour 
Um, they're technically HOV lanes for some part of the road, but then at some point on, on the street when you're going up it or down it, the, uh, the signage kind of just disappears and it isn't repeated. Um, so it is, it is a shared road, even though it's not very well, um, Mark. Yes, exactly. <laughs> and I think the, the biggest, the biggest thing about this is, yeah, Kingsway is not, it's definitely not a beginner's, uh, uh, like commute commuting kind of thing um because you are you are biking right beside cars uh which can be intimidating especially if you're not experienced and if you are and if you're comfortable it's not really a problem like it doesn't phase me at all and people in vancouver are actually fairly okay um i would say more than fairly like fine with dealing with cyclists on the road i actually i'm more concerned about like the actual um the bike routes the uh, like the official like bike paths and stuff in vancouver um because um we have a lot in Vancouver, and it on paper it seems really good. Uh, and then downtown they have all those, uh, you know, separated bike lanes, blah, 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 like all that, like, oh, this is world class, and it fucking sucks. I hate everybody who bikes does not like to bike downtown. It sucks, even though it's like they've got all that infrastructure. Um, for the regular people who, like, you know, commute and move around the city and do their groceries, whatever, um, the bike routes actually kind of suck. They um, they kind of, they're on how they, how they designed it in Vancouver. And I didn't used to think they used to suck. I used to think they were great. And I'll tell you about that. Well, <laughs> but um, <laughs> well, how the design is they use um, like side street, residential streets as bike routes, which is, I guess, when they first invented this, whenever they first invented it, it was a good idea. Uh, I still think it's, they have a place and will always have a place. But um, so they, those are fairly well marked. Um, like it's, it'll be, you know, side streets that are like, you know, that go in straight lines. Um but the problem with these, they don't actually take you anywhere. Um, like, um, they, they take you close to things. Like, for example, like, for example, if I was going to work, um, the, like that Kingsway is like a, it's like a diagonal. If you're, because Vancouver is, a, is basically a grid. It's a very gritty city. It's a very, squ every square kind of thing. Uh, kind of like if you think of New York, it's very, Vancouver is very similar in that sense to New York as in the, the, the street grid is like 90 degrees and 90 degrees <laughs> but um for example the kingsway is this diagonal which goes uh from the next city over uh burnaby and it goes like it kind of cuts through all of that and goes straight downtown so it's a direct route uh but all these other bike lanes are go along this grid so they're all at 90 degrees so the further you go say uh west the further you you you, you will then need to make some sort of right turn or left turn to to get closer to that like that diagonal uh, direction of downtown if you're going there so for example so I, I tested this out actually just this week Paul so to work for me like I said it was like just under 4.5k going direct and then and that takes me nine minutes at the fastest 15 at the slowest ironically traffic is what is the determining factor of how fast I go <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but uh, I so I tried it indirectly via the bike routes uh, the quote unquote back roads. And, um, it was just over seven or so kilometers. Uh, and that took me just under 20 minutes. Uh, not a huge difference, especially since it's a fairly short distance, but the longer the distance, the longer that takes. And also I got kind of lucky with the lights. Uh, so I actually was able to blast through a few lights before they, they, so they weren't red, but yeah, I think, I think my point is why I would change this. Um, you know, people's perception of difficulty biking is that, I think it would actually have a lot of positive effects on cities and city infrastructure because so many people think, oh, it's too hard. It's too hard. Oh, it rains. Um, and why would we spend money to to do this kind of things like uh, make more efficient or more visible or clearly marked bite routes and stuff? And um, I think if, you know, if I were could change everyone's perception like magic, I think it would have a lot of a lot of benefits. <laughs> I think. Like, um, you know, there wouldn't be so many like, uh, roadblocks, if you will, um, to just making like very simple and not really expensive changes. Uh, cause a lot of some changes are like as simple as you don't need to even install anything new. You just need to say no parking on the street or something and people lose their shit sometimes. Um, yeah. <laughs> when Vancouver first, uh, installed all those, um, bike lanes downtown people were fucking nuts people were upset uh, <laughs> and then and then after it was all done and everything settled in people were not upset anymore 
Um, they even, they did this um, on the Burrard Street Bridge. They even installed bike lane. It was, people were angry because they took, uh, it took two lanes out uh, and the constructions like made it one way each way kind of thing. So people were upset. And then after, after it was all done, uh, it became actually, um, like during the summers, it is the most used bike route in North America. Um, <laughs> wow. Um, so I think you know those perceptions like you know people getting so angry about blah 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 this and that i think you know especially when you know when we're trying to make you know all this climate change kind of action and all that and stuff that actually works number one is if you can make things that are accessible and you know uh, you know like that saying kind of like if you build it they will come i really think they will and also changing attitudes so people aren't like afraid to cycle a lot of people are afraid to cycle because they're like oh cars are scary um so a little bit of understanding from everyone. Um, I think it would go a long way to make, you know, making life in cities, you know, not only better for the city, but also, you know, for each individual in the city. And uh, Paul, that's what I would change. All right. What do, what do you think about that? That was, a, that was a rant, I guess. Not a rant, but it was a, it was a long speech. It was a dialogue. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think that... Uh... People definitely think that bicycling is much more difficult than it actually is. Uh, And it's definitely in part because people haven't been on a bicycle since they were a child. Uh, It's definitely a thing here, too. Uh, You know, I think the distance issue gets a bit problematic here because it's like twice or three times as far but uh yeah absolutely like i'm totally i totally you know i'm not um i'm not one of those unreasonable people who are like this needs to happen um but you know every anytime you dip your toes into that that's what people automatically assume (laughs) right right (laughs) you know obviously like you know if your commute is long then like fucking yeah do what makes sense for you obviously but i'm just saying um like you know if you build it and if attitudes change like a lot more things even in different neighborhoods like you know you don't need to commute to work every day by fucking like if your your commute's like whatever 40 kilometers or something 30 40 kilometers um you know if it's safe and it's doable yeah but yeah anyway sorry that's me being a fucking politician or something right now <laughs> <laughs> no we need to i mean the u.s probably even a bit more so than canada like desperately needs to change perceptions about like walking and biking to work and stuff walking and biking places because here that's like absolutely unheard of and i have a question have you ever have you ever have you ever walked or biked to cycle like regularly to work have you ever cycled and or walked to work regularly no i'm just too far from everything that makes that's fine like yeah every city is different and i'm i assume albuquerque never been yet We'll we'll have an episode one day, <laughs> um, but I I assume it's fairly spread out like most like American cities kind of thing. Like uh, you take the highway to go places, right? Yeah, I do. Okay, okay, <laughs> that makes sense. Pretty normally, uh, I mean, if you if you lived in like downtown or something and worked there, then obviously it'd be really easy. Or if you lived. Mm-hmm. You know, near the university, for example, you could bike to work or whatever. If you, and you know, saying you worked at the university or somewhere nearby. But other than that, and then also there's the issue of just like outright sketchiness here. <laughs> and the fact that if you leave your bicycle anywhere and don't take yeah. off the bicycle seat and up both of the wheels, uh, that shit's getting stolen. <laughs> Oh yeah, that's interesting. I can't. I can't wait to go to Albuquerque and visit you. This will be so. This sounds like a very a city with a lot of character. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You could say that. You could say that. <laughs> yeah, we've seen. If you like, go to the university and like go look at where the bicycles. You know, people people lock them. Yeah, they're stealing bicycle seats, tire wheels, whatever. <laughs> And people will tell you that. They're like, if you ever ride a bicycle to you, lock that shit up, take off the wheels, take off the seat. Like, yeah, no, it's not worth it anymore, man. 
That's interesting. <laughs> That's funny. You know, I did. I had my seat still on once. It was really weird uh, because I went. I went. I went to the mall um, to get something. I was there for like I don't know, 10, 15 minutes. Park my bike. I come out, and then I come back, and my seat's just fucking. It's gone. And I was like. I was like, what the fuck? I was gone so little. But the odd thing was, the odd thing was that there was another seat just like, like they took out their seat, threw it on the ground beside mine, and then took my bike seat and put it on their bike, I guess. So I was like, oh, my bike seat, but they left me a bike seat. So they stole mine and just left me another bike seat. And then actually, and you know what? It was a more comfy seat. <laughs> <laughs> so that's, uh, that yeah, that's in some in some parts of Vancouver that happens, uh, like notably downtown the downtown east side or something that might happen. But for most parts, like if you're ever, if you're in a more residential area, like I I wouldn't worry about that at all. <laughs> yeah, that sounds funny though because that sounds like a just a horribly stereotypical Canadian thing to steal someone's <laughs> bike seat and then leave yours <laughs> for them. I, I mean, I think just this what went through the head. They're like. They must have been like, oh, that looks like a sporty seat or something. Like, I want that. And, like, they're like, well, what am I going to carry my seat around? No. So they just like, <laughs> I don't know. It's really weird. Very weird. Yeah. Yeah. So you, so you never, so you never, so you've always had to traditionally just, uh, like, uh, commute to work. Yeah. Yeah. I've never ridden a bike anywhere for transportation. I've walked places, obviously, in Spain. And <laughs> where I, where my parents live, it's in walking distance. You could go to a bar, and that's the only place mm. that's in walking distance. You could actually oh, bike yeah. places. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's a practical, actually, walking distance place to go. I've walked there a few times. But everything else, you could bike to some places, but just nobody does. I've met, like, one, one like, older... Yeah, they're, they're, I, I imagine, like... I imagine like the, uh, I mean, quote unquote, cycling community or cyclists in are like kind of hardcore in that way in Albuquerque, probably, because like there's so little and like they're the people who are like dedicated to doing it, but they're, they're probably fighting for their life every day. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly right. There's I've met one guy in Corrales, it's called where my parents live, that was like, I bike everywhere and he's super intense about it. Uh but other than that, yeah, there's just really not a lot of people doing that. And then also, like, there's a total lack of infrastructure for cyclists. Mm. Like, there's bike lanes in the main road in Corrales. But outside of there, I mean, you know, one, like, stereotypical thing that Europeans experience when they come here is, like, they're like, holy shit, there's no sidewalks. And there's no bike lanes and there's no anything because it's America. Um, and don't forget it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But yeah, there's no like good infrastructure for cycling here. You, you can't like, you know, I mean, it's already like you're saying there's a danger element on some level or that's one thing that people are shied away by. But it's much worse when there's just literally like no real space for people to cycle you can kind of in Corrales but outside of here the other local towns and cities are like practically uncyclable I mean you'll still you'll see people doing it but really they just come off as assholes because there's not fucking space for them but they're still just out there doing it I mean what we're talking like they'll ride on the line that's actually the edge of the street they're riding like on it because there's no yeah, space no. for them yeah no yeah that yeah that's unfortunate i think yeah <laughs> you know like you know the whole thing i got like like i was one of those people who also like didn't cycle since they were a kid but um one of my jobs way back in the day um it was it was kind of like um it was one of the restaurants i used to work at and it was in this area of the city where like it didn't ha there was no tra like public transport that reached it was like a relatively new it was like an emerging neighborhood now there is i think one bus that goes there or something from somewhere um but the, the the way to get there by public transport was like i could take one bus near to my house it would go through this one neighborhood and then it would drop me off at the top of the hill and like it wasn't very fast um because like 
it wasn't, first of all, it wasn't direct. It was like, you know, you had to show up before the bus to make sure you would catch the bus and then it would go through the neighborhood, drop you off the hill and you still have to walk like in the, I don't know, 15, 20 minutes. Um, so what and it ended up being like, basically I would walk to work because sometimes it would literally just be faster than like if the bus just didn't show up, you know, that wasn't in my control. If something, if whatever, I texted the bus, it said it would come and it wasn't coming. Um, so I just, I used to like literally walk to work. It took me, you know, 45, 50 minutes and it was fine. I would listen to music or whatever. Um, and it was, you know, it was, <laughs> I don't know. It was just kind of my, uh, uh, my, my, just my, my reaction, I guess. Like I was like, I, I didn't, you know, I didn't drive, uh, at that point. And, um, <laughs> yeah, I just, I just walked to work. And then one day I was like, this would be way easier if I took a fucking bike. <laughs> yeah. And that's, and that is, that is how. I got into cycling. It was just it was just like a pragmatic kind of way. I was like, I just won and I got a bike and I was like, cool, this takes me like <laughs> like when I worked at seven in the morning every day, I, I would woke up at six forty five and then I'd be at work by seven. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so from from my bed to the door of my restaurant was fifteen minutes. <laughs> that's nice. <laughs> and that's yeah, that's that's how like honestly, that's how it got to. Like it was basically just a commuting that's all for me and it was it was nice uh it was also at the bottom of one of the steepest hills in vancouver so it was uh, it's about a 120 meter climb very short it's a very steep hill um so that uh, that'll get you strong real fast if you do that uh five days a week or plus more <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> that's true man yeah uh, do you find that you have quads of steel now uh no my commute is so easy right now um, like I don't, so like I usually like on, on the way back, I do take that longer seven ish K route, uh, because it's just going on the, on those bike routes is more relaxing. Uh, and also like, I don't, when, when I'm going in the morning, I'm pretty fast. My, my top speed in the morning can be like 50 K an hour on my bike. Uh, so, and so whatever that is in American, but 50 K is like city speed limits. So I can match traffic speed at some points. Um, um or actually match it like when you when you're commuting usually you never go the speed the speed limit unless it's a very like there's not much traffic you know what i'm saying right yeah <laughs> um but yeah no when i when i did used to work there and then i also worked at another restaurant that was um also at the bottom of the hill but just uh in the next city over um that 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 was like i actually i googled that actually before this and that was about a 7k uh, trip as well uh it seems way further especially if you go by car it seems so far but it's like it's not <laughs> yeah going back to the perception of things like you look on a map and you go by car and like the way you need to take you're like wow like i could never walk here but um yeah no it's uh, so i was biking there too <laughs> so anyways <laughs> yeah <laughs> i don't remember what i was answering <laughs> <laughs> that was a while ago <laughs> but... Yeah. Yeah. This I know. I know this is very preachy, and I don't. That's the one thing I don't like about like, quote unquote, advocating for cycling stuff. Like it. It always just comes off as so preachy, because it just does. I don't know. <laughs> and I'm just. I'm just like. It's a pra Like, but like, like I said. Like when I went. When I first was it was just a pragmatic, easy way of doing things. And I still think it's a pragmatic, easy way of doing things. And yet, there's obviously a gradient and everyone has a different fitness level and blah, 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 blah. Um, but, you know, like I said, if you make things, you know, Kingsway is a nice, relatively flat thing versus like the hilly side streets. Um, and yeah, that was another thing about those side streets is um, they're hilly. Um, going to work on the direct route was only seven meters of elevation. So nothing. It's wow. mostly downhill, right? Um, going on the side route was a hundred meters of elevation, which isn't a lot over like seven K versus a hundred meters over like one K. Uh, <laughs> um, but like still it, it, it's a little bit of a workout, um, going up at like the, it's, it's not a flat city. So yeah. that, that also affects, you know, the regular person or the person who wants to get into cycling. Well, the thing that I just thought about too is I, which I've never even thought about with, uh, on this topic, but is just, you know, you couldn't get, like, super obese people to do this, right? Like... What kind of what? Obese. Obese? Oh, well, you know, it's totally it's totally doable. I, like, I think cycling is super, super accessible, especially now with the rise of e-bikes. Like, if you say so, I, I feel like... I'm sure, I'm sure there is a point at some point, but I think that's like some sort of like uh, American TV extreme. Uh, um, well, we're talking like 160 kilograms and up. 
or like 150 or 125 even is a lot then like to be riding a bike everywhere it's just like an issue that i hadn't even thought about in terms of you know getting people to cycle say you did build the infrastructure right like some people would have to lose weight just to be able to ride the bike and that's like a lot of americans okay i mean possibly possibly I, and I and I guess that that also goes back to the perception thing. That also goes back to the perception thing. Like I'm saying, I've 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 seen people on the commute like they're like you know, not not the not they are like bigger people, but they're they're riding and they're like going to work and they're they're doing it or you know just on the weekend. So I think it's totally doable. Yeah, yeah. I'm saying it. Yeah, yeah. As long as they got a bike that's big enough for them, I think that's good. It works. If it works for them, it works for me, man. We'll be back right after this. So if you haven't already, you can follow us on Instagram at uh, King of the World Podcast. You can also follow us on Twitter at If I Were King Pod, or email us at If I Were King Podcast at gmail.com. And of course, our home on the web is If I Were King of the Dot World. So, um, you know, we've, we've touched a lot on about American culture and a lot of cycling culture kind of stuff. Um, what are you bringing for a cultural corner today? Yeah, I kind of have a mix between cultural and historical. Uh, Do it. It's a bit, you'll see. Anyway, so I have something on, on the topic of uh, fascism and uh, historical. <laughs> Let's get into it. <laughs> <laughs> episode three the heaviest episode ever yeah shit's gotten a bit heavy so far so uh there was this guy yeah ron jones a high school teacher it, back in 1967 this high school teacher uh basically became a fascist dictator in the classroom in order to teach his students about fascism so 1960 is this a, so give me more context where is, is this in the states yeah, yeah, California in 67. Okay, 1967, California. Southern California? I don't know. Somewhere in California. <laughs> Palo Alto, I think it was, maybe. Okay, okay. So that's somewhere. Anyway, uh, he was like, he's a history teacher. So he was struggling to teach his kids why the Germans kind of, you know, you know why the holocaust happened basically and how they permitted it and didn't stop it etc so he decided to do an experiment in his classroom and like teach them about fascism so on day one he wrote so each day he like wrote a different motto on the chalkboard and like then they practiced it basically so day one was strength through discipline so day one he starts teaching them discipline right they all have to sit up straight and if they don't he's gonna tell you hey sit up sit up straight fix your posture and uh, he also had them do little things right like you have to stand to answer a question you have to stand before speaking Um, you have to answer in precise responses that are like three words or less and different different things day two strength through community so he tells them that you know strength comes from being united and from being working together and being strong uh, together so he gives them membership cards and like little note cards and then though he he takes an extra step which is on the back of some of them he puts a a letter x and if you get one with a letter x then you're part of his gestapo basically and they were told to like you know whatever uh enforce adherence to the values of the uh the movement that he was creating which he called the third wave because apparently the third wave in the ocean like the third one in surfing terms coming towards the beach is the strongest one so the third Mm -hmm. wave and uh he basically kept going on with this day three was strength through action 
uh, and he told them that community and discipline are nothing without action. You have to actually do stuff to be strong and uh, to be a strong group or community. So, uh, but they act, the bad thing was they actually did start acting and they started making posters and recruiting other kids and doing all sorts of shit. And within a few days, they had recruited like 200 kids. So it was a classroom of like 30, but eventually they had recruited to the point where there were like 200 people who were part of this like movement at the school. And they were doing all sorts of shit. They had a bodyguard move. They had like a group that was the bodyguard of the movement. And they had like physical assaults happening and all sorts of shit. Uh, Day four, he tells them, because it's getting totally fucking out of control, right? Like he did it as an experiment. And now they were actually like, you know, they were saluting and doing all sorts of shit. Uh, What, like Nazi saluting? Yeah, like, well, he invented a salute for them. That oh, like he made one up just for yeah, ish. It was like you hold up your anyway, but uh, they were actually getting really fucking into it, right? And physically assaulting people and all sorts of shit. So he was like, "This shit's getting out of hand." Day four, he's like, and also he said that he reported his experience with it too. Was he started getting like really power hungry and enjoying it and like. You know, he said it was like a fucking huge power trip that like people were saluting him in the hallway like everybody and all sorts of shit. Anyway, day four, he's like, this shit's getting out of hand. I need to stop it. So day four, he's like, we're all going to meet in like a auditorium tomorrow and we're going to watch a movie about the national movement of the third wave and... Uh, there will reveal the secret leader, right? Like the, the leader of the national movement. So day five comes and he just plays like a blank screen and then explains to them that they basically joined a fas- fascist movement and totally just bought into it. And like that, uh, that, that was, you know, allegory to what happened in Nazi Germany. And then he showed him like a documentary about Nazi Germany at that time or whatever. But yeah, this is like some real shit that actually happened and basically became a movement, a movement of like 200 people at a high school. And then he put an end to it. But uh, so they made some movies about it that were really I watched one of them that was a German production. Uh that was called like the third wave in German or whatever, but or the wave, I think. Wait, is that a is that a, a movie? I mean, the TV show on Netflix or something? No, there's a different one that's called the third wave that's not related to this. Okay, I think I watched what you're talking about, a German thing called the wave. Yeah, I've watched I watched it this summer. Oh, okay, yeah, there's a an American movie, a German movie, and then there's also like probably at least one or two more documentaries as well. Uh, But yeah, and yeah, just thought it was really interesting and really horrible because it's like, wow, humans are actually pretty susceptible to this shit and uh, it could happen again. Like, and we need to be aware of that and not, not do that. But I thought it was interesting that it was like, this American high school teacher just, I don't know, did this. Yeah. What, um, I don't know, did the the teacher have, like, thoughts after it all happened? Like, what what did he, like, obviously he was trying to teach a lesson, but then what did he think of it himself afterwards? Did he, did he have regrets or something, or? Um, I couldn't find too much about that, actually. I'm sure if you, like, watch the document... I didn't watch the documentary ever. I just watched that movie. But uh, I know. I think that he did end up getting in trouble for it at one point. And mm-hmm. also, uh, I mean, like, he's, like I said, he did talk about, like, how he felt power-hungry during it. And he felt like really enticed by that because it was just such a emotionally powerful weird thing that humans can experience 
yeah, like acknowledgement kind of thing. Yeah. Interesting, Paul. How what what this bring up? How did uh, this come up in your life? Have you been trying to make a fascist cult recently? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how the hell I got to this, but for some reason when I thought about cultural corner ideas, I I jumped to this. I mean, like why why this stand out to you, I guess. I mean, like um how, did you watch this just on your free time, or is this something like somebody recommended to you? No, I watched it in Spain actually. Uh, oh, for my, wow. I had a European cinema class. Oh, cool! Yeah, so we watched it, and uh, it's stuck with me since then. It's really interesting and crazy that that shit just totally fucking works on human beings. There were actually, I mean, they talked about, there were, you know, like, quote, the smartest kids in class, like, whatever, however you want to find that, were, uh, and, you know, certain other characteristics, personality traits, made people not fall for it. There were certain personality characteristics that people had that made them not want to participate in it but most people the vast majority of people actually just totally participate in something like this there's a certain percentage that have personality traits that um they just won't but such a big percentage will actually just become a fascist if you Hmm. create symbolism and um like we talked about that. It's the symbolism. For some reason, that's like really powerful for human beings. Like if you have a scapegoat and you have like a salute and you have discipline and rules that you're supposed to follow. And then if you don't follow those, then there's extremely harsh consequences and stuff like that. Like if you have certain requisites, most people will just become a fascist pretty easily. Right. I feel like I'm um, not even just, uh, it's an interesting point, the fascism, but I just like any group kind of thing. It seems like if you have a sense of uh, belonging, uh, a clear, um, I guess you'd call it like a motto um, yeah, or a slogan or something. And then if you have enough people, you know, that like kind of building a sense of community with, I guess, like you said, like some sort of ritual, a.k.a. discipline. Right. And some sort of message and then a little bit of structure behind it. Uh, a lot of th- people could do a lot of um, things of that. <laughs> yeah. And potentially good, but uh, it, it, it can be powerful in a very negative direction, apparently. Interesting. Interesting, Paul. Yeah. So, <laughs> what what do you got for me, Norman? Um, so, what I got... Um... So that's it's very interesting. We're both like on the same page today. So you're doing something within the States. I'm going to do something very, um, very Canadian. So do you know who Terry Fox is? I've heard of his name, but I don't, I don't remember. No. Okay. So, um, on September 18th, every, every September 18th, um, every, everybody, everybody in Canada does this thing called the Terry Fox run, which is a, uh, a day where, you know, um, go for a run but it's in memory of this guy called terry fox where who and this is and this is all in support of cancer research um and terry fox he is uh quite literally a canadian hero terry fox is like a legit soup like he's a hero <laughs> um he was um his super young guy at like 18 he was diagnosed with um cancer and he lost his leg to it um and then um he used to be he used to play a lot of basketball and stuff like that and that didn't stop him like once he lost his leg he played wheelchair basketball won some championships and stuff um but he wanted to do more and he was just like when when he went through chemo and all that stuff and this was in 19 like 1980 um or 19 late 1970s um um he was really just kind of like appalled by like the like being in the cancer ward and seeing all these kids going through this and he was just like really appalled by like like why isn't there more money coming to this um and like he he when he was in 
in the before he lost his leg, he read something about like how somebody ran um, a marathon with just one leg, and that kind of inspired kind of the rest of his um, the rest of his life. Uh, he started training uh, as soon as he could. He ran uh, he ran like um, he ran a race. Um, I don't remember how long it was, but he ran a race and completed it. You know, dead last, uh, obviously, is one leg, um, but but prosthetic leg. And once he completed that race, he said, I'm going to run across Canada uh, and help try and raise money for cancer research. Um, so this guy was like, I don't know, like 19, 20 at this point, maybe 21. Um, so what he did was he dipped his prosthetic leg in the Atlantic Ocean and um, he went, he wanted to run all the way to the Pacific uh, and dip his leg in the Pacific Ocean. Um, and this guy's originally from um, Port Coquitlam, which is a, a suburb of Vancouver. Um, um, I actually did, um, I did some shooting for a local newspaper for that day. So uh, if you want to go on my site and check out those photos, you can. Um, cool. But I, that's not the point. <laughs> um, <laughs> that's just kind of why I'm talking about this, because this was recently, and that's what prompted it. But yeah, this guy, like, like a legit superhero this guy like he ran he ran a marathon every he ran 42 kilometers every day um with his team in a little van um just running every day he was trying to raise money at first like nobody you know at first like nobody noticed but once it started people noticing the media picked it up and it became like the most like watched thing like ever <laughs> um like the entire country like uh, got behind this guy because of like because this guy running solo people started like the communities he would run through, people would join and start running with him. And they, like his goal was to raise um, $1 for every Canadian. And at that time, that was, I don't know, 26 million people or something. I'm not sure. Um, and since then, they've raised, like, since then, they've raised, like, well, like half a billion dollars or something. Like, over $500 million have been raised since, like, 1980. Um, but, um, you know, this guy, super heroic effort kind of a tragic ending you know he he managed to go from the maritime provinces through quebec to ontario and his journey ended in thunder bay which is almost in the next province um it's the end of ontario if you're going west um because the cancer um re-emerged and it in his lungs so that he had to he had to stop and go back and get treatment and then uh wasn't successful for so at he he died like about nine months a year later or something um uh to the cancer that reemerged, um, but ever since then, um, people started to do the Terry Fox run every September eighteenth, and um, yeah, I think he's like one of the most like inspirational people ever because he did something super, super selfless, super, super difficult because um, it wasn't like the press like legs were not good in nineteen eighty. Um, well, he he would describe it like he had a twenty minute pain threshold, like it was super, super painful. And then after 20 minutes, it would kind of like be manageable. So every day, like, yeah, he was like, and if you ever watch any videos, he had a really weird gait, like a running mo movement, like because of just how the, like the springs weren't very good as they are now and stuff like that. So yeah, it was a, it was like for a, a marathon of like, like suffering every day. Uh, and like, you know, he would also fit into the day, like speaking at schools and events and stuff about, you know. Uh, raising money for cancer and stuff like that so i think um that guy is uh, a true hero in the in the sense of it you know um he didn't he didn't make he didn't make it to the other side but uh i think his like his his legacy has a really long long-standing legacy like uh, you know his family's still big into you know his his legacy his foundation um i met his brother um at the the P pork Quitlam, um called the Pork Room Ter Hometown, Terry Fox Hometown Run. Um, so, yeah, I think that's kind of just a little quick little cultural thing that I think, um, to me, is very, very Canadian. Not many people know about it, or maybe you've heard of it, but you don't really know about them. But, uh, yeah, true hero, to me, at least. And um, that's what I wanted to share today. Cool. I didn't... I don't know if I'd heard of him. Terry Fox sounded like a celebrity name, you know, and I was like, oh, maybe I've heard of that. Before. He definitely had celebrity status, but I wouldn't have called him a celebrity. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, no, that's cool, though. I've never heard that story. Uh, yeah, I mean, if you have time, I really, like, would just recommend going on YouTube and just Googling him. And if, 
there's a million probably documentaries on him and if you watch one you'll get very inspired uh but yeah like you know he was like he was he was 22 when he when he passed away so like you know this guy was you know he was doing something really big uh, a lot bigger than himself kind of thing yeah so the when you said like he that had raised ultimately 500 million dollars for example that's, that's like the terry fox foundation through cancer and stuff up till like 2022 yeah. gotcha gotcha that wasn't like in that day that moment like i think they like i think in his lifetime or the rest of his life it was they did raise a dollar for every canadian so like 26 million ish dollars um a couple provinces also helped like the province of bc did a million ontario did a million i don't think the other provinces pitched in at that time um but yeah um that's pretty amazing the like local governments pitched in or the not local but you know provincially i guess yeah that's pretty interesting um yeah just um even the day of the um the terry fox run one of the um fundraising people um like when they were doing some one of the speeches on stage before it started like she was she was they were telling me like oh this woman don't remember her name i'm sorry but like she raised ten thousand dollars today it was like before noon <laughs> and so like you know people it carries a lot um his name and uh his his legacy yeah gotcha um should i forget i don't know uh i don't know maybe cut this part out <laughs> i'm not remembering <laughs> now it stays in paul um last time last time we checked in uh you've changed your degree yes very true <laughs> tell me why what happened <laughs> uh, i was studying eeg right electro neurodiagnostic technology electroencephalographic technology specifically which is like a subfield basically i mean i was working you know long hours at the hospital doing nights different things like that and yeah i was planning on doing that as the career but basically i couldn't like make enough money to comfortably move out of my parents house and you know move out and like eventually do my thing have a career uh so i was like i'd rather look for something that i enjoy but also pays good so basically i did that uh so what was it you're studying again now civil engineering water resources specifically like environmental engineering more or less just more i i would guess i would guess that that field in particular is in very high demand but also has um changed a lot i guess in how they teach it and how it's um um used in practice like back in the day like you know the, the states like literally would maintain or redirect the course of rivers to make sure they fit uh i'm thinking like uh like the missouri like um not the missouri sorry the mississippi no missouri which one mississippi mississippi thank you <laughs> <laughs> um got the mississippi like um i think it's baton rouge you can like there's like a, a like a dam there that redirects and also like a bunch of some concrete on the bottom that redirects it to keep maintain its current route because if that dam is broken the 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 mississippi would go in a totally different it would go in a different direction and empty in a different place in the gulf of mexico and uh, new orleans would uh not have a reason to exist anymore because there would be no river going through it <laughs> um that so that's what i mean by like you know you think the hoover dam and stuff that's what like i think the old school traditional civil um um environmental engineering kind of thing and i think a lot now has changed and it's more about kind of more of a how can we use it more effectively responsively and probably um I, I guess more in step with like natural um um cycles and stuff I, that's what i assume and my guess would be how it's changed is that what you you've so far noticed um i mean it's not totally like that because you can do almost anything with that type of degree right so you could mm -hmm. work in water and wastewater you could work in wastewater treatment plants 
you could work in uh, pipe design, so water pipes. You could work in water retention, like you're saying. You could work in like reducing our expenditure of water and coming up with technology and designs that will do that. Uh, but you mm -hmm. could also work with uh, stream stream restoration, for example. So you could uh, take a place that's been really polluted or that's been really disrupted by human activities or something like that and bring it back to being, uh, you know, more of a thriving habitat, uh, stuff like that. You, you could basically do anything. But yeah, I would say, you know, we're not making as many like hydrologic dams and stuff uh, to produce electricity. So definitely some of those like old school civil projects like that are no longer being done. Um, a lot of the work is, uh, and, and then there's other sides to the work too, like flood control, basically things like related to climate change uh, in particular, like, um, you know, how's weather changing and is that causing more and more intense flooding, things like that, that those are also considerations. So yeah, it's changed with, with, climate change as well basically. right and 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 albuquerque is that uh, what desert are you in is that the mojave to be honest i don't even know chihuahua and desert potentially yeah chihuahua and desert okay interesting so yeah are you uh are you excited i guess how much longer do you need for schooling then at this point <laughs> four years <laughs> <laughs> oh boy yeah uh but i'm excited about it uh, I basically do two years of part-time school just to do the prerequisites mm -hmm. for a master's degree in engineering okay. for people okay. without an engineering degree. Right, because you already have you already have credits from other shit. So right, and then I can just jump straight into the master's. It'll take two years. Uh, I'm just about to start an internship doing engineering work locally. So yeah. oh, that's dope, dude. Yeah, yeah. I'm excited about it and it's like it'll be a really good internship because there's field work and there's like work in a laboratory so it's not just um you know something on a computer all day or something so i'm so excited awesome. about it i can't wait to hear more about that have you you've started already or are you starting i'm about to start in the next few weeks put it that way i can't wait to i can't wait to hear more about this hell yeah man and and i have a question what do you know about St. George, Utah? Nothing. <laughs> so I, I, okay, that's really interesting because um, I've been monitoring, you know, on our, our site visits and stuff like who's, who, who's coming to visit us, who's, who's listening to our stuff. And there's a disproportional amount of people from St. George, Utah. <laughs> so um, shout out to St. George, Utah. Um, Thanks for listening. Uh, <laughs> but um, so I was doing some Googling because I was like, why? I'm like, is this close to you? Like, do you know anybody here? <laughs> so I'm glad they're organically, <laughs> they're organically listening. Um, but did you, so like, it's like, it's like, it's a bit, so I feel like this shouldn't be a surprise to you, but it's a very Mormon place. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they have a big like church in the middle, uh, <laughs> that Mormon church. And um, I don't know if you Google them, you can see like their flag. Uh, they also have a logo for some reason. The city has a logo, that, which is strange. Usually you have a flag or a logo, but they have both. Um, <laughs> and it looks kind of very corporate-y, like, um, like the umbrella company from Resident Evil. <laughs> okay. <laughs> like they're going to take over. Like they're doing some weird research over there. <laughs> yeah. It's very corporate-y. Very corporate-y, uh, but also like it's all it's all sunshine over here. Don't look over here too closely. <laughs> <laughs> do you know? Do you know why in Utah there's so many Mormons? What's up with that? Why Utah? There was something I don't know the full story or something, but I think it was just something to do with like escaping religious persecution a long time ago, and so they went out west because there was land that you could get or what i don't know something like that okay but okay. yeah i'm totally kind of speculating although i feel like i've heard that at some point very interesting 
what so what are your thoughts on utah overall um haven't been there too many times i've passed by salt lake city looks pretty cool uh looked like a nice city i mean mountains mormons are nice they've got a lot of rules and you know like they don't, do they have do you say they have a lot of rules and discipline would you say they have a lot of rules oh they also have discipline though strong sense of community strong sense of community yeah <laughs> <laughs> are mormons a fascist state in disguise yes no i'm kidding <laughs> hopefully we didn't we didn't bore everybody with the fucking bike talk